born in Flint, Michigan, 1950. John Patrick Addis was someone who most would consider attractive and talented. Standing at six feet tall, green eyes, blonde hair, and athletic, he had no trouble getting women to fall for him. Not only was he amiable, but he had the brains as he was excellent at school maintaining high grades, and expressed a high interest in medicine. Additionally, he was talented in sports and musical instruments, like the piano as he shined in both. After graduating high school, he would enroll in college and work as a lab technician. He would soon get married to his first wife, Jody, who was a registered nurse. The pair would later have three kids together and plan to settle in their hometown to raise their family. To most, they were the perfect family, and to John, it was. As long as he was in full control of everyone, that is. Sometime in his early 20s, John lost interest in college and dropped out. He lost his desire to study in the medical field and wanted to leave Michigan. He grew up loving to fish and to hunt and always loved the idea of living in the wilderness. So John had the idea to move to Alaska. Jody was not in favor of the idea, but to John, it doesn't matter what she wants. It's what he wants and therefore, everyone needs to follow along. So the family would move to Sitka, Alaska. There, the family would live in a small one-bedroom cabin in the remote woods. It had dirt floors, no running water, no electricity, or a heater. For food, John would hunt reindeers to feed his family. While the family settled into their new home, John demanded that Jody should stay at home to take care of the children and not look for any jobs. Even though Jody wanted to work as she had an amazing career, she obliged. As for John, he sought a career in law and first began working as the city's dog catcher. Eventually, he joined the Alaska State Troopers at the age of 24 in 1974. He was assigned in Fairbanks, Alaska. After a few months, he got to know the rest of the state troopers and got along very well. They all liked John, one of them being Alaska State Trooper Sergeant John McCann. The two worked together for a few years and got along great. Though, McCann couldn't help but find Addis' lifestyle to be a bit out of the ordinary. When McCann questioned his lifestyle, he responded that he believed in living the way many Alaskans did decades ago. While Addis did lose his interest in medical science, this didn't affect his love of science as a whole. It was his favorite subject after all, so he brought his knowledge in science to his new career. It was said by Addis's fellow troopers that he had amazing skills in crime scene investigation and attention to detail. Both Addis and McCann took classes in college and read many books in collecting evidence, such as collecting hair, fingerprints, fibers, understanding blood splatter, and so forth. Now heading into the early 80s, this is when John Addis' fellow troopers would notice something odd about him. One day when he came to work, they noticed an opening in his armor. When pointing it out, John looked at them with a straight face and insisted that he regularly saw little humans that he referred to as the thems. And that was it. Nothing else was ever mentioned about these supposed little humans he talked about, but eventually, they would see his behavior decline in early 1982 when Jody filed for divorce. Since the day the Addis family moved to Alaska, Jody faced abuse by John Daly. He would abuse her physically and verbally, and would never refer to her by name or use any cute names that most couples call each other. Instead, John would call Jody mother. The real reason why John wanted his wife to stay home to watch the kids full time was to isolate her. Not only was she prohibited from working, but also from driving, having any friends, or having any contact with her family. He wanted her to feel dependent on him, as well as knowing her locations at all times. One day, while the two were in his truck, the two got into an argument. John wouldn't pull over so Jody can get out, so Jody jumped out of the vehicle. John would begin chasing her from his truck. Once catching up, he grabbed her and threw her back in, and that was the final straw for Jody. Shortly before Jody filed for divorce, the couple got their fourth child. As terrible as John was at being a basic human being, he really did love his kids, and they loved him, so he fought for custody of his children. He told Jody that if she doesn't give him custody of their children, he would load them up in a plane and crash onto the side of the mountains. Jody didn't let this get to her, and in the end, she won custody of her kids. 
However, John was allowed for a liberal visitation of his kids during the school year and custody for six weeks each summer. Now for Jody, she's not worried that John could see the kids. After all, she knows her kids love their father very much, but she worries if John is capable of hurting their kids during the six weeks they're with them. The thought of that was continuously running in the back of her mind. Once the divorce was over, John lost interest in his job and stopped talking to his fellow troopers. A few months after the divorce, John's life would turn around when he met another woman in Fairbanks. This woman's name was Sarah and also had children of her own. John would soon quit his job and decided he wanted to go back to medical school in Florida. He even presented the troopers an acceptance letter he received from the university. Once he and Sarah began dating, they were inseparable and eventually got married in December of 1982. After the wedding, the pair moved to Florida to begin their life together happily. And then Sarah filed for divorce five months later. John was abusing her the same way he abused Jody. During their time together, he would often disappear for weeks, never letting Sarah know his whereabouts. John has mentioned to Sarah that he wanted to kidnap his children so he can have them living with him instead with his ex-wife. She expressed that it would be a horrible idea and refused to help him. Once they were divorced, John was a single man again. Until he met another woman a few months later. The woman he met was named Tony, who was a pharmacist in Sarasota, Florida. They began dating and John got married yet again. In 1985, they got their first child together. Shortly after the birth of their first child, John began to abuse her the same way he abused his last two wives. He would question her whereabouts every day and follow her to work to make sure she did drive to work and not elsewhere. If he didn't, then he would check her odometer. Though that wasn't the worst of his abuse. At one point, he lifted her off the ground while strangling her. He even told Tony his plan to kidnap his children back in Alaska. And of course, his wife refused to help and suggested that it was a bad idea. Finally, Tony was feeding her baby one day and John rushed into the room. The look on John's face was terrifying to her. John stepped on her foot, grabbed her by the hair, pulled her out of the chair and began shaking her. After this, she filed for divorce and got a restraining order. Oh, and the acceptance letter he presented to his former troopers was a fake. He never returned to school at all, nor did he have any plans on doing so. In August of 1986, John wanted to see his kids before their summer vacation ended. He planned to have them fly out to Chicago where he would meet them there and then drive to Michigan to see his family. Jody refused and demanded that if John wanted to see the kids, he would have to fly out to Alaska. She took the matter to court hoping to convince the judge that the visitation must take place in Alaska, but the judge declined and ordered the kids to fly out to Chicago as John requested. Now with the kids at the airport, Jody cannot stop thinking about John's threat during their divorce. At this point, all she can do is sit and hope that they return. When the kids were supposed to return to Alaska, they didn't. After a few calls at the airport, it turns out the kids never boarded the plane in Chicago to head back to Fairbanks. Jody called the police in Fairbanks to let them know what was going on. The police there would then call law enforcement in Michigan to look for John and the children. Months went by and police couldn't find John or the kids anywhere. Even with help from the FBI, they still struggled. Flyers were posted around the state with a sketch of John's face, hoping someone would come forward with any information. Eight months later, someone at a gym in Kalispell, Montana reported seeing a man that matched the description of John Addis. Police rushed to the gym, and there he was. They finally got him. John was brought back to Fairbanks, tried, and sentenced to four years in state prison for parental child abduction. He only served 18 months before being released in 1988. He was allowed to move to Fresno, California, as long as he reported to a parole officer in California. Once settled into his new home, it didn't take long for him to fall in love with another woman, and we're back to where we started. After meeting a new woman, the two fell in love, got engaged, moved in with her, and then he stole her money and disappeared. He never reported back to his parole officer, and his fiancée never reported to the police that he stole her money. 
California never issued a warrant for John jumping parole. Instead, they closed his case, but Alaska issued a statewide warrant and the law would be looking for John for a second time. John moved frequently after leaving Fresno and would then change his name to John L. Edwards. He finally settled in Las Vegas, Nevada in 1995. He would work as a fitness trainer at a gym where he would meet women, date them, smother them with romantic promises, and then steal their money and leave. He would do this for a while with several women until he finally found the one. During his time working there, one of his clients, Tara Rivera, found him charming and had the bright idea to introduce John to one of her best friends. That friend was 39-year-old Joanne Albanese. She was a single mother with two children and an employee at MGM Grand. The two clicked and began dating almost immediately after meeting, and the two were happy. But John was not honest with her. He told her he has never been married before, has no children, and avoided mentioning his prison conviction. After a month of dating, John was relying on Joanne for almost everything. He would stay most nights at her house and had Joanne pay for all of his meals and his gas. According to Tara, he seemed overly obsessed with Joanne, and it was making her uncomfortable. But hey, as long as Joanne's happy, there shouldn't be an issue. However, Joanne's oldest daughter found John to be creepy and believed he was only with her because of her money. One evening, John, Joanne, Tara, and their husband went out for dinner at a restaurant, and this is when Tara realized the type of person John was. While the four were eating, she said she made a harmless comment that made John punch the desk giving her a terrifying death stare. The punch was loud enough to attract the attention of others in the restaurant, and that stare of his was enough to send a chill down her spine. After experiencing that, she planned on calling Joanne to warn her about John and that she should leave the relationship. When that day arrived, Joanne agreed with Tara that she should leave John. Behind closed doors, John was controlling her, which is nothing new, so Joanne was going to end the relationship. On August 18, 1995, Joanne called Tara letting her know that she was planning to take John out for dinner the following day to end the relationship there. Tara was relieved to hear that this would be the end of Joanne's nightmare, but this would also be the last time Tara would ever hear from Joanne. That same day, Joanne's ex-husband came to pick up their kids for the weekend. He would return two days later to drop them off. When the two girls walked inside, they noticed something strange. Every time they returned, their mother was always there to greet them, but this time she didn't. The house was completely silent with no sign of Joanne anywhere. When she wasn't home, it was usually because she was still at work, but she would still let her kids know that she would be running late. But again, that never happened. All the lights in the house were on as well. John's pickup truck was outside the house, but John was nowhere around. Upon entering the garage, Joanne's vehicle was missing. When they approached their mother's room, they noticed a few issues. First, her door was wide open, which she would always leave closed and locked before heading to work. Second, her bed wasn't made, and again, she always made her bed before leaving for the day. Lastly, when looking through her drawers, they found a few of her bracelets that she always wore, and her purse that she never left behind when going out anywhere. The last time anyone had seen her was on August 19th, when she left work at 4.30pm. The girls called her father, to which he called the police a day later. He hoped maybe John and Joanne went out somewhere together, but when they failed to return the following day, that's when he called the police. At first, the police didn't take her disappearance seriously, but days passed and there was still no sign of Joanne or John. When Joanne's family noticed that John never showed up to work for days, this is when they suspected that John is behind her disappearance. Detectives approached John's truck and decided to run the plates on that vehicle, but it came back empty. There were no records showing it belonged to anyone or any vehicle. When they stepped inside the home, they searched through John's belongings. In one bag, detectives found a wallet that was duct taped shut. Upon opening it, they discovered three IDs, but they all had the name John Patrick Addis, not John Edwards. One driver license from California and another from Alaska. Finally, the third being a certification card from the state of Alaska that says he was certified in crime scene investigation. When they looked up John Addis, they discovered he was an ex-felon who was a former cop. This worried the detectives because now they realize that John has the knowledge to cover his tracks and avoid capture. On August 23, 1995, police received a call from a hiker who found Joanne's car just outside of Prescott, Arizona. 
Police found no evidence in the car. They believed if John had killed Joanne, her body shouldn't be far from where the vehicle was found. They searched all around, but came empty. Even though they couldn't find her body, they were certain that John did kill her. The area where her car was found is only three hours away from the Mexican border. They suspected that John may have crossed the border to avoid the law. And they were right. As police continued to look for John in the United States, John was living in Guadalajara, Jalisco, in Mexico. In late 1996, he had several jobs. He worked as a tennis instructor and an English and piano tutor. Lastly, he changed his name yet again and now went by the name John Stone. He was a regular at a gym in Guadalajara and befriended many people there. He lived with a few of the people he met and they would also give him money because they felt sorry for him. After dating several women throughout his time hiding in Mexico, he finally settled down with 25-year-old Laura Padilla. Her father thought the relationship was quite unusual due to the large age gap, but he figured that John was nothing more than just a friend, but the two would later get married. Now a year later in 1997, back in the United States, police were still searching for John, but after running a few dead ends, the Geraldo Show broadcasted an episode dedicated to the disappearance of Joanne. After airing pictures of John hoping someone would recognize him, the show would receive a tip shortly after the episode aired. The tipster notified the producers of the show that he knew someone that matched the description of John Addis and that he was living in Guadalajara. He even told them the exact gym that they could find them at. But the producers made a big mistake. Instead of contacting the police immediately about the tip, they contacted Joanne's family. According to her family, they had trouble contacting the authorities, so they called the gym in Mexico themselves. When they called, the gym manager was asked if there was someone who fits the description of John Addis. At some point, the manager would then approach John, notifying him that someone contacted the gym, asking for him. It was at this moment that he knew he had to leave immediately. John went to Laura's apartment and convinced her that they should leave Guadalajara and move elsewhere. They moved down south to Chiapas, Mexico. Once there, John would again change his name to John Charles Peterson from Canada and would have two children with Laura. Their neighbors there considered him to be a happy loving father, but others didn't like him as they noticed how controlling he was to his wife. Laura never told anyone she was moving because it was so sudden. John never gave her the chance to tell anyone. Back in Guadalajara, her colleagues were worried when she didn't show up to work. When they notified her family, her sister got inside Laura's apartment hoping to find her okay, but she didn't find anything except a note that was on the floor. The note said that she loved John so much and that they just got married, so it was her time to move and start a life together elsewhere. It ended with her saying that she was okay and would call them soon, but Laura never did contact her family. That was the last time they ever heard from her. Whether she wrote that note herself or was forced to remains unknown. Back in the United States, a hunter had called the police after discovering skeletal remains on a hill. After further examination, the police learned the remains belonged to Joanne. Her remains were found a mile away from where her vehicle was found. It turns out the police had underestimated John's strength to carry her body up on a hill all by himself. Sadly, because Joanne's remains were nothing but bones, medical examiners were never able to determine the cause of death. But with her remains found, it gave the family some closure. All that is left now is finding John. For years, police struggled to find John and still had no idea that he was living in Chiapas, Mexico. Many television shows such as America's Most Wanted would broadcast his case, asking the public for any information on his whereabouts, but to no avail. John remained hidden for years until police caught a break nine years later on October 18, 2006. Back in Chiapas, John's neighbors noticed that they have not seen him or anyone else in his apartment for a while. And worst of all, they noticed a foul odor coming from his apartment. The front door was unlocked and as soon as they opened the door, the smell of death hit their face instantly. The neighbors found Laura dead on her bed and her two children dead on their bed, both ages 4 and 7. They called the police and the autopsy report showed that all three had died from carbon monoxide poisoning. After the neighbors discussed with the police, they learned that John Charles Peterson was actually John Addis. The Mexican authorities began searching for John, but it would take several weeks before the law caught another break. However, it wouldn't be the break they were expecting. 
In late October, a hotel maid in Guatemala discovered a dead body laying on the bed. After contacting the police, they discovered that the man they found was John. When a detective back in the United States found out, he asked if they could make sure that it was indeed John and not some look-alike. But after checking fingerprints, it was confirmed to be John Addis. His cause of death was ruled as a heart attack. The police found key items that point that John may have committed suicide, but it wasn't enough. In the beginning, John had everything going for him. He had the brains, the looks, and most importantly for him, the women. But his life began spiraling down the moment he started to lose control over his significant others. After running from the law for 11 years, John Addis managed to avoid capture by staying one step ahead of the police. I just can't help but ask, would John Addis be sitting behind bars right now had the production crew informed the police right away instead of Joanne's family? Lastly, I want to mention this comment I found during my research from someone who claimed to have known John. It reads, I worked with John Addis in Fairbanks, Alaska, 1973 to 1976. He was at an outpost then. He seemed like the nicest, most charming person. Would never have guessed he was controlling, let alone a murderer. I was back in the States and watching America's Most Wanted when I found out what a monster he really was. <laughs>